How's it everyone? This video expedition will cover the space shuttles and their missions in For All Mankind's alternative timeline for NASA, Roscosmos, and private industry in expanded aerospace operations unfolding in the 1980s and 90s. A link to the previous three videos will be at the end and listed down below in the description. In this parallel universe, NASA's space shuttle program began development in 1970 to replace the expensive Saturn launch rockets with a reusable launch vehicle that lifts cargo into orbit while safely returning to Earth and landing on an extended military runway. By 1983, NASA has a fleet of nine operational space shuttles. This pales in comparison to a fleet of six shuttles constructed from 1976 through 1991 in our own historical timeline of events. After the testing phases, the first shuttle named Enterprise was retrofitted for military service in the specialized branch of the Air Force for national defense and strategic operations. A second shuttle, the Constitution, would join this new Space Command a year later with classified launches restricted from media coverage between 1978 and 1980 due to increasing Cold War tensions on the moon. The American military and NASA developed the program in secret to prevent Soviet intelligence from discovering its existence. This brings the total number of shuttles between NASA and the military to 11 launch vehicles in 1983. The first publicly released launch of STS Shuttle Challenger lifted off in 1981, announcing to the world the capability of this new type of cutting-edge reusable launch vehicle. The Challenger's STS deployment mission delivered a refueling station attachment in low Earth orbit to Skylab, further expanding its capability with the station now redesignated as Skylab Advance. This enabled future shuttle missions to dock and refuel in low Earth orbit for lunar missions planned to phase out the remaining Saturn V's in the Apollo program that ceased production in the 1980s, gradually being replaced by the new fleet of production SDS shuttles as the final Saturn rockets are expended. In advance of every shuttle mission to the moon, a Delta or Titan III cargo rocket delivers the payload propellant to Skylab's docking module, then transferring the fuel into the storage tank for the next STS translunar injection burn. These new space shuttles now assume the role of transporting crew replacements to the Jamestown moon colony, along with logistical supplies, essential components, and sensitive items for engineers and technicians on the surface. Upon arriving in orbit, the crews then are ferried down to the surface by a retrofitted Apollo landing vehicle, now performing cargo and personnel skiff duties to and from the Jamestown landing field. After successfully unloading the payload, the shuttle preps for the return mission executing a docking maneuver with the Lunar Depot Station to refill the spacecraft's propellant transferred from the Moon Lab's fuel tanks for the main engine's Earthside return. Then calculating telemetry into a precise atmospheric trajectory and orbit flight path for a runway landing into a gravity well some 240,000 miles away. Combined with the large Sea Dragon cargo rockets, the space shuttles would perform dozens of STS lunar support missions over the following years, expanding the Jamestown Colony and Lunar Gateway Station. In 1980, the Soviet space agency Roscosmos began production on their own shuttle launch system, the Buran. In spite of America's attempts to keep their SDS specifications secure, KGB agents still managed to acquire NASA design and engineering blueprints, allowing the Soviets to reverse engineer their own reusable launch system. Through the 1980s and early 90s, Roscosmos built five of their VKK space 
space orbiters. Unlike the Americans, the Soviets continued the heavy launch vehicle and series program into the 1980s and 90s, improving and retrofitting their new rockets. It is unclear if all five Soviet shuttles were cycled into service, but at least two, and possibly a third, VKK return vehicle were identified by NASA and U.S. military intelligence. In 1983, the second generation space shuttle took its maiden flight, lifted into sub-orbit by a C-5 Super Galaxy heavy transport plane. The OV-200's advanced nuclear fusion plasma engines allows the space plane to achieve orbit with a full payload without needing a detachable solid rocket booster system. Additionally, these new shuttles do not require refueling in low Earth orbit before the lunar transit missions, making the Pathfinders a multi-role rapid response space vehicle. With the increased payload capacity, a second Pathfinder mission in 1985 deployed Skylab B into low orbit. The station had been retrofitted and repurposed as a dedicated space shuttle way station for STS lunar refueling missions. The Skylab fuel station significantly improved mission turnarounds as space shuttles operating in Earth orbit could dock and transfer the excess fuel prior to atmospheric re-entry. With two STS fuel stations now in low Earth orbit, NASA and the U.S. military have the capability to double their timetable launch windows and rotational schedules for the new fleet of space shuttles. This extended operations around Earth orbits as well as lunar transport and cargo transit operations. By the late 1980s, NASA and the Air Force had a fleet of 12 cargo shuttles and three Pathfinder space plane transports with a fourth under construction. Combined with this new space infrastructure's allots for two STS multi-role mission windows per month. The first enhanced Skylab was further expanded through the 1990s into a dual purpose fuel and research docking station that would eventually become the first dedicated international spaceport for direct Mars launch windows and primary merchant trade hub of the lunar economy. Private aerospace companies subcontracted STS shuttles combined with their own space planes to collect expanded solid rocket fuel tanks to form the structured network of the Space Hotel's artificial gravity centrifugal ring. Retrofitting the STS tanks into habitat modules allowing occupants 1G gravity during their stay on the Polaris station. By the early 1990s, the Earth Luna infrastructure had been completed. Jamestown Colony had expanded to large-scale helium-3 deuterium harvesting for Earth's new fusion reactor power grids. Lunar Gateway Station and the International Spaceport, along with spacecraft construction orbit yards, are now in place for the planned interplanetary Martian colonial program. Pathfinder shuttles will perform regular 30-day cargo runs for orbit logistics to be transferred to the Red Planet's surface, made possible by the advanced fusion plasma drives. Through multi-billion dollar subcontracting, NASA was able to fund its own space programs through the private sectors like Helios Aerospace and Polaris, along with international bids from other nations across the planet. The conventional powered space shuttle fleet would continue on as the logistical backbone for the Earth Luna economic trade network. During the race to Mars, the Americans, Soviets, and Helios Industries on their interplanetary expeditions would come together paving the way for the Seven Nation Mars Co-Prosperity Treaty that would build the new Happy Valley base into a thriving colonial settlement, elevating human civilization into the initial phases of being a dual planetary species. 
Star City and Jamestown Lunar Colonies at the brink of war a decade prior now are working together combining their trans lunar Martian infrastructure into a shared and prosperous interplanetary merchant industry finally elevating the home world from the grip of fossil fuels into a new clean and renewable energy of helium-3 powered fusion reactor planetary network grids Thank you so much for watching and make sure to hit all those buttons if you want to help support the channel. And feel free to leave a comment as I do read them all and value your feedback. And now is a perfect time to hit the links for the three previous videos covering for all mankind. And make sure once again to have a great soul.